This is Morning Perfect Bass. I'm Van Velding and I'm going to work on my perfect bass a little bit each week. And after a couple of weeks, uh, we're going to see how far I've gotten. We're going to see how much progress I've made. It is day, so unlike with some of the other episodes, I don't immediately have to uh, go to sleep. Uh, part of what I'm doing today is I'm going to try to finish up these walls. Um, and maybe even clear off the top of that west wing so I can put some torches down. And the torches are not the permanent solution. I'd like to, to make that clear. The torches are just uh, what we're doing right now. It's j They are just as permanent as the dirt in the dirt walls. Just something that we can put up and replace with something better later. I, I don't really know what. A lot of... A lot of the roof is going to be farms, and so the farms allow me to add torches organically to uh, the plots. I'm going to base the plots on the standard pre-gen plots that come with villages. Uh, I believe it's going to be uh, seven, two rows of seven, uh, which are going to be expanded out into, um, I think, a seven by nine uh, elevated plot with stairs on the side uh, in kind of a frame. Uh, and because those are odd numbers, I can put torches up the even values of it. I am not going to use full logs on that. I don't know what I'm going to use. I may just use planks or stairs. Oh, I'm going to use stairs. Traditionally, I use stairs to frame my farms. Yeah. So, I think I'm going to keep that right where it is right now. I, I know I'm doing everything else about of dirt. That wall, it, it, I don't know. It just seems more uh more classic more iconic to me like that wall has had the most work that wall leads back to um megalopolis and perfect base three eventually by way of a whole bunch of shit but it does and uh, it's also one of the more approachable walls that allow me to actually get into this place i'm gonna continue on with part four fourth and final i promise part of the Enterprise One project whereby all characters in Star Trek are assigned to Jim Kirk's USS Enterprise. I think last time I talked about rooming arrangements, I talked about uh, watch stations a little bit. I kind of ran through the watch stations. So today I'm going to try to talk about uh, the, the Star Trek Enterprise crew and a little bit about some ancillary and supporting characters and maybe a little bit about story and then we're going to be done. So, uh, right. Some shifts don't have specialists in certain fields. I think naturally they'll have to have that. If, if, even if it's just someone to deliver a line that says, hey, uh, shields are given out or whatever. So, to fill in those gaps, because I don't know enough about these characters to actually make them central characters, central to the story. I'm just going to put the folks from Star Trek Enterprise in there. Um, so... You know, for for the Delta shift with Captain Janeway, she, I believe, doesn't have anyone from the navigation department in there. Oh, no, she has Sulu. Operations, then. She doesn't have anyone to do operations. You know, Jonathan Archer fits in there. Why? Because he knows how the ship works. Because Enterprise has such a different structure where we don't have a presumed uh, method of progression through Starfleet, where they just kind of make up Starfleet and Archer's the captain. Uh, they don't have those divisions planned out as, as deeply, and therefore no one has a career trajectory up through previous divisions. So I'm going to take Archer's general operational knowledge of starships and just say, hey, he'd probably just be fine at operations. Uh, Hoshi Sato, I believe, is a mission spec for the Alpha Shift. They don't have anyone like that. Again, I consider her to be a very versatile person. She's a polyglot. Polyglot? Polyglot. Regardless, uh, Flox is obviously our medical guy. I personally think he is the best thing about Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, unfortunately, I just do not know a lot about him. But, you know, he'll be around. He'll be around. Uh, T'Pol is going to be doing our science. Uh, also for Alpha Shift, simply because they, they were just running short of two different categories. Um... And let's see, Trip is going to be doing navigation engineering. Uh, same thing with Mayweather. Uh, the, the, what is that? The Zeta Shift and the um, Epsilon Shift were both running short on that. So you have both those guys in there. 
And then finally, Reed is going to be filling in uh, in security on the Epsilon shift. Um, yeah, just again, background characters. Uh, if if you like them, if if you listen to this and you say, "Hey, I want to work with this," that's the plan. Uh, that balances things out, and you uh, reap reap the benefits of my foresight. Uh, for for the enlisted ranks, we are going to need enlisted ranks. For this, Star Trek has always been kind of nebulous about that. You have a chief, you have a crewman first class. I mentioned that in the previous episode. You have general crewman. I have no idea what that structure is. Memory Alpha has a little bit of help, but it's very much, they just made things up on the spot. And as I mentioned earlier, the enlisted officer division doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think chiefs would be reserved specifically to people who do not want to uh, not start over again, but who don't want to go through the junior officer ranks and say, hey, look, I'm a senior enlisted. I can do all kinds of things. Um, I'm free from those obligations of, of officership. So I just thought, let's just keep it simple. Let's, let's not do like a, a, a master tech or um, a, a class, like first class, second class. I think petty officer, I was a petty officer, and it's a stupid ass rank uh, from a, a very old time. So let's just say, hey, look, crewman, um, junior tech, technician, senior technician, junior chief, chief, senior chief. And that's it. There's just seven of them. Uh, and if you want, you can throw in like a junior and a senior tech. Uh, not necessarily. Junior and senior uh, crewman. And, you know, that's fine too. Whatever works for you. Just keeping it nice and simple there. If you look at Chief O'Brien's neck thing, he's got two of these chevrons and then two dots. This is after he goes to DS9 and he has a proper chief insignia. Uh, so basically, crewmen have no insignia. They just have that weird little shield thing that O'Brien has. Junior tech, tech, senior tech, each get one more little chevron thing. And then chiefs just get dots. I believe Chief O'Brien had two dots, and therefore his three chevrons and his two dots mark him as a regular vanilla brand chief. I think that's just fine. The There are some other characters who are not part of the the regular Starfleet military thing and they've always been kind of shoehorned in, into different plots and I think it's a great idea to have a series that doesn't need Starfleet personnel to make the plot go. Starfleet personnel or Bajor militia, militia personnel. Just, you know, you need some civilians who exist in the world and that these people interact with as part of their life system. So uh, Quark uh, I think that Quark is just a special trade envoy. You know, you're working out of a sector of space. It's the frontier. Quark is a trader. He has his own ship. Maybe he has a, a station of his own or a place on a station that the ship visits. A uh, home port, maybe. There's no reason that a Starbase couldn't have a deal with a private contractor to, to just uh, operate out of the Starbase to the, their mutual benefit. No one trusts Quark naturally, but there you go. Ron could be his envoy, regardless of how Quark fits in there. Garrick, not envoy, uh, Ron, Ron would be his assistant um, on his staff or whatever. Uh, Garrick, Garrick can be a special diplomatic envoy. That's his freaking job. He's a freaking spy. We don't need for him to be the guy on the outs. He can be more antagonistic. He can be aligned with the Cardassian Union. And maybe he can fall from grace later. Maybe that can be a story that we see. And that, you know, if you're a, a fan of Bashir and Garrick having a relationship, that can definitely be an issue where Garrick undergoes an arc and Bashir facilitates that. Um, I don't think... Yeah, no, Gar Garrick doesn't have to be redeemed, but he is a character who could be redeemed if you're going to saddle someone with a redemption arc. Neelix, Neelix sucks... I, I've made that clear before. Ne Neelix could be another roving trader. Uh, he could have another setup like Quark. Trying to see Neelix and Quark go against each other. I I say this. Uh, you, you this would put Neelix in his native environment. This would put Neelix in his wheelhouse. He wouldn't be like a funny supporting uh, side character for Star Trek Voyager. He would be in his element and in control of his destiny. Uh, I think a good reason for him to hang around the ship would be infatuation with Kess. Uh, as creepy as that infatuation has always been, 
Seven, I think a civilian science administrator who works out of the star base. She could be an occasional mission specialist. Certainly, uh, in this version, they the ship would take on mission specialists for various missions. They they've done that before um, for various diplomatic things and scientific missions. And I would like if Seven would be like a regional science person who handles a lot of that stuff. And she's a blue org, and so no one trusts her. That's just common stuff. Um, but she has her own place. She manages to be somewhat at peace with the universe. Or maybe she, uh, it, it would be hard to imagine her just being Annika and then being assimilated later. I think she would have to be assimilated as a kid still and then unassimilated. And even if she's assigned to the ship long term, I, I think you could still have some of her missions in there. Naomi Wildman, I really want her to be on the ship with like a special dispensation because her mom's an alien and their aliens don't leave their kids behind even for these kinds of things. And Captain Kirk's like, ah, I have a child on board. And Captain Picard's like, mm, well, you know, it's a respect cultures. Uh, because Picard doesn't have to deal with her. Um, but at the same time, Naomi Wildman is, is a good kid. I don't know if I'd want to put her on a starship that's in danger every week. You know, I, I think just having her on the starbase with Jake Sisko would be would be fine jake cisco obviously he's a reporter he represents a lot of the media for the for the united federation of planets that we never see in the show rarely ever see in the show um and i think that actually gives us enough of a civilian crew between keiko and jennifer cisco and jake cisco and who, uh, even even barash why the hell not why not barash from the episode of future imperfect where Riker adopts a gray alien uh, you know, put him in there, put Alexander in there. Um, maybe Lwaxana Troy visits. I, there's there's a lot of room to put family on the Starbase and to have cool adventures that happen there. I mean, you're not in deep space for years at a time, but let's be serious. Kirk, Kirk was called to deal with stuff in the Federation, like, a lot of times. He wasn't so deep that he couldn't respond to the odd Romulan threat or Cleon threat or whatever. So he he wasn't in the middle of nowhere. He might as well have a star base that he he calls a home port. So so I think that that covers characters. I apologize if I if I'm forgetting one. Uh, so the next question is, what are these characters doing? What's what's the story that they're in? And uh, you know that's pretty strong because I'm not really good at light fluffy stuff. You know, there, I want there to be stakes and conflict. I want there to be an idea. Uh, one of the story ideas I, I had on the table for the Star Trek Fate campaign I ran literally ends with uh, one of our characters being an envoy going down for a diplomatic mission. The ship goes off to do something else. Uh, it turns out they're, the, dip, the people were being diplomatic with their bad guys. He meets the cute resistance lady, of course. And just as she is about to... The ship comes back. The captain beams down, who's an NPC. And the captain's like, hey, what up? And our, our character who has briefed her briefed her on methods of sanctuary and asking for the Federation to intervene and kind of um, set her up to say the things necessary to get Starfleet to help. Uh, she breaks through. She runs up. She is immediately and dispassionately gunned down. And the, the captain cops to what's going on pretty quick. And he's like, oh, dang. Sorry about that, bros. Um, well, good to see this diplomatic mission has been successful. Later, dude. And he and our, our, our player character beam out uh, while her body is still warm. And it, it is designed to leave a very bitter taste in the player's mouth. Um, it's, a, it's messed up. And it's because in that campaign, the Federation... Um, all the humans had left, so the Federation was run by Cleons and Romulans and Cleons and Ferengi. And I think I think one of those should have been... I think that second Card Cleon should have been the Cardassian. And, you know, so, so I didn't expect these characters to be Starfleet Paragons. I think that's a, a lot to ask for in a role-playing game. So I just said, hey, look, you're all kind of a-holes. And, and my goal is to exemplify the basics of... Federation values and Starfleet values by uh, making even those flawed characters the good guys in, in a messed up universe and to eventually allow them to rise to the level of power where they could make things better or to make the decisions where they can. 
or to even make the bad decisions. You know, they don't have to make the right decision. They don't have to like fume over the death of a, of a democratic protester. They, because each of them are going to be different people with different values. So any, anyway, it was, it was dark and I was willing to do some fairly messed up things if not to get the players on side, but to get the players offside in a lot of ways. Let's start cutting this down. Future site, perfect base four. All right. I don't, I don't take in these vistas enough. After I did the fast forward video, uh, one of the notes I had was, hey, take in the area where you're going to work before you work on it and then after you work on it to show the difference. And I have just been the worst at that. <laughs> anyway, so you know, for me to shift to do something that's very fluffy, that everyone survives, that there are tough decisions, but they make it through, uh, that people suffer, but there's a limit on that. Um, that that is not really my wheelhouse. I thought the first thing I could do, the first thing is take the most popular Trek plots and kind of rehash them, revisit them. Uh, perhaps even the least popular plots, um, the different types of plots. I thought the first thing I could do, I, I don't know if it's too on the nose or not, but I think it's fair, is to say Chief O'Brien wakes up one day or he turns a corner and suddenly... He's got the everything is all wrong itis, and and there, there's no cure for it. They don't. They're not like, oh look, it's a tachyon thing. Like O'Brien just suddenly rem remembers that things should be different. He kind of remembers how things work, but he kind of knows that all of these people aren't usually together. And and again, it's a completely unresolved mystery, and O'Brien just sort of lives with it after that episode, or it occasionally comes up. Uh, but of all people, O'Brien's been on Kirk's Enterprise. O'Brien's been on Deep Space Nine. O'Brien's been on the Enterprise D. O'Brien has seen Voyager. He was there when Voyager passed through. That's kind of the weakest link. I, do, I don't believe he has any connection whatsoever to Enterprise. However, Colin, um, you know, I, I think he's your character who's got enough spread to say, and then who suffers enough for no reason. To just say, "Hey, something's not right here. This, this is how it usually is," and then and then we, we kind of drop that because um, it doesn't pay off. Because you expect it to pay off, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to. It's just O'Brien saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we know we know this is different," with a little bit of foreshadowing, um, and maybe occasionally he can say something about it. So, um. It would be interesting if, if we were to mix a few episodes. I think two of the ones I had were Arena and Distant Origin. Uh, Arena is the one where Kirk fights the Gorn. The Gorn blow up a human colony because human because the colony was in Gorn space. Uh, and the Gorn, the Gorn aren't like clear out or whatever. They just murder a colony. And Distant Origin is the one where Voyager finds out that the dinosaurs are sapient and they left Earth before the asteroid hit. And they have a religious dogma that says that they are not from Earth like the humans because they are so superior to us. It, it, if we, it would be interesting if we were to take that. Um, so, so they kill a colony for being gene thieves, right? Because they think, uh, oh, look, these people have our genes. These humans do. Um, we got to kill them for stealing our sacred freaking genes. So... Uh, so, so then our crew uses their identity of genetic dogma against them because these are many saurian species, right? And they say, well, you know, if if you have all these species and if humans are slightly different, then, you know, how are we stealing their genes? Are not the apatosaurs stealing genes from the tyrannosaurs? Or, you know, whatever. And, you know, we can say, hey, look, these species were millions of years apart. How, how do you even reconcile that? And... Uh, it's, it's a good opportunity to talk about the uh, archaeological history of Earth, but um, zoological history of Earth, geological history of Earth, to, to talk about some of that stuff instead of just saying, heard through the dinosaurs are religious and stupid, which I was never... A lot of the Voyager episodes were really on the nose, and um, they, they lacked a certain amount of coquettish ideology. Anyway, anyway, anyway... Uh, so that would be pitch number uh, like four or five, honestly. So uh, Tribbles, Cleon's Intrigue, and Dax 2. Uh, a Tribbles episode. 
um, let's see, a lore episode, but instead of making lore like a whole other robot, lore is the part of data that has feelings and emotions. And so data physically becomes lore. And you can't just shunt lore physically out of the enterprise and call it a day. You have to get rid of lore. You need to fix data. Um, which kind of also brings in the, the Dax one. Is it Joran Dax? That's the, the secret personality inside of Dax, which is interesting. Uh, let's see. Oh, two ships. As seen in the classic Mirror Mirror, Yesterday's Enterprise, the Voyager episodes, Equinox, uh, and Deadlock. Where Equinox is a different Federation starship, Deadlock is the Voyager has been copied. Uh, Impoc Nor does it. Uh, Living Witness kind of does it, where everyone's like the same but evil. I think Living Witness is sort of considered to be the Mirror Universe episode of Voyager. Same, same as uh, Yesterday's Enterprise is kind of the, the Mirror Universe episode of the original series. And we don't talk about the DS9 Mirror Universe episodes. Uh, Galactic Politics, uh, a little mix of Journey to Babel, A Private Little War, Balance of Terror, and The Pale Moonlight, and the, the original Maquis episodes. Again, you kind of put all that into a rue. There's a personal story. There's a uh, conspiracy theory and stakes there. People are competing. Uh, you know, and that that's a good kind of story to hang this on. None of these are specific pitches, I don't think. Let's see. Time. <laughs> I actually have time in all caps. Uh... Timeless, worst case scenario, blink of an eye, city on the edge of forever. Uh, just what if time episodes? Uh, let's see, regular politics, Darmok, Arena, Corbomite Maneuver, Distant Origin again. You can kind of see that, that that's where I put the seeds down for the episode I pitched. Uh, let's see, Jatrell, Duet, First Contact, Distant Origin, Bride of Chaotica. Okay, those are all... Um, you know, we're talking to aliens, we're trying to figure this stuff out. Um, again, I, I think good episode is the type of episode that you want to see in Star Trek. War, I'm a little less encouraged about this one. Uh, Call to Arm, Sacrifice of Angels, Siege of AR-558. It's only a paper moon, Memorial, Hard Time, Hope and Fear. I forget what Hope, I forget what hope and Fear is. Uh, hard Times, more Voyager, loses their memories and gets imprisoned. Memorial's the one where they remember doing a bunch of atrocities, but it's actually, like, the literal war memorial makes people remember the atrocities, which, damn, son. And the rest of them are DS9 war episodes. This man, this alien. The Wire, where Garrick is addicted to a brain thing. Mortal Coil, where uh, Neelix dies, but Seven fixes him for some reason. Uh, Mock Time, where Spock gets the, spa the space horny. Uh, latent Image, figure what that is. Oh, that's the one where the doctor forgets things. He makes a choice between two patients, and they erase his memory to keep him from going insane. Uh, I think Suspicions? I think, is that the one where... I forget what Suspicions is. Um, but it's a Voyager episode. Are We the Baddies? Uh, space Speed... Space, <laughs> space Seed slash The Neutral Zone, though his episodes combined pretty well. The Omega Directive, where they need to Voyager destroy Omega Particle. Uh, I'm, I'm running real short on time here. Uh, the Voyager Conspiracy, which is the one where Seven gets all paranoid. Measure of Man, The Drumhead, Lower Decks, The Offspring, Devil in the Dark. Makes things a little complicated. Uh, ask us to interfere. And then Space is Scary. Uh, Space is Scary is the Doomsday Machine. Uh, Q Who, the best of both worlds, IHOP, Iborg, Descent, Scorpion, etc. And then any other scary uh, space one. So, um, anyway, I can just leave. <laughs> so until I get a good sign-off, guys. Bye.